when I think about Shavuot, I think about just, um, um, I think about many things. I think about uh, just how this, this feast, this offering, this harvest festival um, has changed over the centuries. Um, from the get-go when um, God has given the commandment to observe Shavuot to Messiah's time of Shavuot and Pentecost to after the destruction of the temple to even today and what we're doing here today. And for some of us and many of us, we're kind of scratching our head. Um, we know that this is a moed, an appointed time. Um, and we'll, we'll, we will read those scriptures. But what is, the, what is the practice? What is the prescription in terms of what are we to do about it? Right? Because we read, and we will read, that, well, they knew exactly what to do. There was a temple. There was sacrifice. There was bringing a free will offering of wheat and bread. Right? Um, and it's wonderful and beautiful, and everyone all over the world came. Um, and so, but today we don't have that temple. What do we do? I think about just as we unpackage all of this and we start to put all of this together, um, it is overwhelming to see the goodness and just the glory of God in how he puts everything together and how he has ordained and we are so small in comparison to, to the largeness of, um, <laughs> of what he has done and what he is doing. And, and it's overwhelming, to be honest with you. When we face all of God, we can't comprehend all of it. And we start to see, and we're just left speechless. We're left in this position of humility and our, and our finiteness and our humanity and, acknowledge him, and acknowledging that He is God and He is in control and He is worthy of our praise worthy of our sacrifice. And what a beautiful thing that he, he says, come participate. Come be with me. And it ought to blow us away that as for believers, it's like, no, I want to reside in you. All of this glory to be housed in humanity and, sorry, <laughs> but you just think about it, and it just, I guess ought to bring you to tears, maybe, <laughs> ought to acknowledge his goodness, ought to acknowledge just how great our God is, what this day is all about is acknowledging, <laughs> acknowledging his greatness, worshiping him, celebrating him, and connecting with the Holy Spirit that resides with us, in us, because of his Son, who has baptized us with his Spirit. Okay, now look at my notes. Here we go. <laughs> uh, Shavuot, uh, similarly to Passover, demonstrates the faithfulness of God in working to make us into a people of his own. We see our salvation fulfilled with Passover and Yom Habikurim, 
by Messiah's death on the cross as the Passover lamb and the first fruits of those who will be resurrected through his resurrection. And in Shavuot today, 50 days later, it is the giving of the Holy Spirit, the sealing of, an, our, of our inheritance, the empowering of God, the fulfillment of the law being written on our hearts. That's what today is. So we're going to look at this in the biblical sense um, through Scripture. We're going to look at it historically. We're going to look at it um, um, at Pentecost, at Yeshua's time and the apostles. We're going to look at it after the destruction of the temple. And then we'll talk about the Holy Spirit. That's what I'm proposing to do anyway. We'll see, we'll see how it goes. Shavuot just simply means weeks. Pentecost, similarly, in the Greek, um, it actually means 50. Um, but to represent what this, this, um, this day is, the, the Feast of Weeks. Um, and that 50 is that counting of the Omer. We had a calendar out there of 50 days where we're counting the Omer, and that's also biblical, and we've talked about that from Yom Habakkarim all the way down to right now. Um, let's look at some scripture in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 9 and 10. It says this, I have my eyes in today, so I can actually look and read. Um, <laughs> that's what we call, um, that's what I tell my kids uh, what uh, these contacts are. I'm putting my eyeballs in. Uh, okay, it's a dad joke. Uh, you shall count seven weeks for yourself. You shall begin to count seven weeks from the time you begin to put the sickle to the standing grain, the barley. Then you shall celebrate the Feast of Weeks to the Lord your God with a tribute of a free will offering of your hand, which you shall give just as the Lord your God blesses you. And let's look at Leviticus chapter 23, 15 to 17, and it says this, You shall also count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day when you brought in the sheaf of the wave offering, again, similarly, what the previous verses said, right? There shall be seven complete Shabbats. You shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Shabbat then you shall present a new grain offering to the Lord. You shall bring in from your dwelling places two loaves of bread for a wave offering. So unlike the uh, first fruits offering, which was to be unleavened bread, these are leavened bread, okay? Made with two-tenths of an ephah, they shall be of fine flour baked with leaven as first fruits to the Lord. The purpose of Shavuot was to glorify God and to give him an offering before we partake of the harvest for ourselves, at least for then in that setting. For Israel, um, as I've previously uh, talked about, that we don't often think about Israel being so much as an agricultural um, land at that time, but it very much was. When they came into the land, they took possession of it, that every person had an inheritance of that land, and they worked the field, and they grew barley, wheat, and all kinds of fruit trees. And it, <laughs> um, the land was plentiful, and, and they followed the seasons. They depended on the rain. They depended on God's God's sovereignty and provision and goodness. And with that, as they harvested, God said, give me the first fruits. Offer up before you partake. Give me the first fruits. And so that's what Yom Habakkarim and um, uh, Shavuot represents. Giving of the first fruits, of first the barley and then the wheat. Okay separated by 50 days. 
And so here we are. Passover, Passover just um, a few days, right, within that same timeline of Yom HaBikarim. And um, it was one of the three pilgrimage uh, festivals. We have Passover, we have Shavuot, and we have uh, Sukkot, okay? Where pilgrimage being everyone, at least all the males, were to come up to Jerusalem, come up to the temple and give a sacrifice. So in Torah, clearly, what we read here, it's clearly a harvest feast and a sacrifice to God, uh, but for believers. So I'm kind of switching back from then to now, then to now, and we're, we're kind of going to go back and forth. But for believers, it's prophetic fulfillment waiting to happen. Okay? So let's look at some of the um, Jewish historical perspectives on this. Um, after the destruction of the second temple by the Romans, the Jews were scattered throughout the land outside of Israel. The rabbis focused Shavuot on the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai, and they celebrated by reading and studying the Torah. It was a shift, actually, a shift in focus from an agricultural celebration to a celebration of Torah because they no longer had the land of Israel and the temple specifically to celebrate this agricultural and specifically the sacrifice, okay? Um, it was the rabbis of the first decades after the destruction of the temple who changed the significance of Shavuot and proclaimed that at Seret, the solemn gathering, was the celebration of the giving of the Torah to Moses on Mount Sinai. So I'm going to read a quote here from Rabbi Eliezer ben Hyrcanus. All agree in respect to at Seret that it is required because on that day the Torah was given. He's quoted in the Talmud. Uh, Talmud. Eliezer based his assertion of an ancient tradition that placed the giving of the Torah uh, in the month of Sivan, a tradition that appears in the apocryphal 2nd uh, century BC book of Jubilees. In the third month, when the children of Israel were, to, were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came, uh, they... Um, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. Um, here's the thing. Right after the crossing of, of the Red Sea, three months later, they come to the foot of, of Sinai. But in terms of when the giving of Torah came, we don't quite know. That's why it's very close. And so traditionally, we can only call it traditionally. We can't emphatically say that this was the exact day that Torah was given. It was on, given on Shavuot. But so traditionally, we hold to that, that God gave the Torah on Shavuot. It actually fits quite well. I don't necessarily disagree, but I just want to be very clear that there's no biblical specific day that we can track that. But it fits very well. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 10 through 13, it says this. Remember the day you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb. When the Lord said to me, assemble to the, peop the people to me that I may let them hear my word so they may learn to fear me all the days they live on the earth and that they may teach their children. 
You came near and stood at the foot of the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire to the very heart of the heavens. Darkness, cloud, thick gloom. And the Lord spoke to you from the midst of the fire. You heard the the sound of words, but you saw no form, only a voice. So he declared to his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, that is, the Ten Commandments. He wrote them on two tablets of stone. Jewish practice, um, then, after the destruction of Torah, included the reading of Torah, specifically the book of Ruth. So practices change from one from going to the temple, temple's gone. Much of agriculture or even possession of the land, gone. So they were unable to follow this Torah practice. So now, Judaism changes. We actually have Judaism. Um, Reading the book of Ruth, they ate dairy, products. Today, religious Jews still celebrate Shavuot by reading Torah, while most Israeli Jews of the land have really forgotten Shavuot completely. Okay? However... Shavuot for believers is a celebration of the fulfillment of the feast of the giving of the Holy Spirit. While the Jewish community still waits for the mystery behind Shavuot. So there's amazing parallels here with the giving of Torah at Sinai, okay? And Pentecost or Shavuot. So you guys ready for some of these? There's giving of the Torah and then giving of the Holy Spirit. Just a phenomenal parallel here. The Word of God given to transform His people into a holy nation. And then the Holy Spirit given to a people to transform their very lives so that they may walk fully in newness of Him. In Mount Sinai, 3,000 people died because they disobeyed. On Mount Sinai, during Pentecost, 3,000 people were saved. And we'll read about that. God gave them on Shavuot at, uh, at Mount Sinai tablets of stone, Right? At Pentecost, through the Spirit, Jeremiah 31, 33 was fulfilled. It says this in this verse, But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declare the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. The greater Jewish community sees the original feast and the giving of Torah with Sinai as two different things. Um, at least they celebrate it differently. The disciples, one, the disciples did not celebrate Pentecost with giving of the Torah in mind, simply because they had the temple. It was firmly a harvest and pilgrimage feast. Although some might argue that because they stayed in the upper room dedicated to word and prayer, they were observing it as the Jews did after the destruction of the temple. And that's okay. We can can have uh, varying views about this. It's all good. Let's take a look at Acts. Let's take a look at the time of when Shavuot, well, it's actually Acts chapter 1, verse 4 through 8. So Yeshua, right before his ascension, right before going to heaven, he speaks to his Talmudim. He says this, in Acts chapter 1, verse 4 through 8, he says, gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which, he said, 
you heard of from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Not many days from now. So when they came together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom of Israel? They weren't quite following what he's talking about. And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or epochs or which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and even the remotest part of the earth. So they obey him. They stay in Jerusalem. And we know this, that this is a pilgrimage festival. And so everyone is gathering in Jerusalem, right? And many um, are holdovers from Yom HaBikarim and Passover. They're staying for a whole three months. They've been partying. They've been doing business. They've been hanging out. And so it's a large crowd in Jerusalem. That's the context of the first three chapters in Acts. So they're waiting. They're waiting patiently. And everyone is celebrating or anticipating Shavuot to give their offering at the temple. Let's read Acts chapter 2. I'm going to read from my fancy new Bible. Um, And when the day of Pentecost had fully come. So Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 13, and this is kind of the portion of this this sermon where I'm going to read some some verses, and I think it's important too. I'm not going to paraphrase. I'm not going to try to explain. I'm just going to read. I want you guys to listen what the Word of God says. So 1 through 13, it says this, when the day of Pentecost had fully come. So Shavuot day of Shavuot, has fully come. They were all together in one place. They obeyed the Lord to wait, wait for this helper. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues like fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were bewildered because each of them was hearing them speak in his own language. And so they were astounded and marveling, saying, Behold, are not all those who are speaking Galileans? They're asking, how can they speak in my language? These guys clearly are from a region, and they probably don't know any other language. Verse 8. And how is it that we each hear them in our own language in which we were born? Pantheans and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia. I was doing really well. Phrygia? Okay, thank you. Phrygia, Pamphylia, Philia, Pamphylia, Egypt and the districts of Libya around Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. Okay, where am I? Yes. Cretans and Arabs, we hear them in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others were mocking, saying, 
<laughs> They're full of sweet wine. These guys are drunk. That's essentially what it's saying. We're going to stop right there for a moment. Let's, let's just sit with this passage for a moment. I just shared to you the context of, of this of Shavuot at that time and what they understood. And many Jews from all around the world came, made a pilgrimage, and they went through great lengths. And so many, so th this is the diaspora that we're talking about, right? And they want to be obedient and come to Jerusalem. And so um, they're all coming from um, great lengths, from south to north to to east, no one in the west necessarily, but uh, to the east, and, um, and they're coming, and they're sitting there, and they're gathering, and now it's Shavuot, and so everyone has come together to bring their sacrifices, and what happens? They hear noises. They hear, they hear the sound of witnesses. They hear the sound in their own language of Galileans, people that are just in that region, right? Just like, what is going on? And they're hearing it from their own language. Many of them perplexed and saying, there is something going on. These guys are speaking a language I know, but they shouldn't. And they just listed about a dozen languages here. And all of it glorifying God. Yeshua says, you will be my witness. Here comes the helper coming down in tongues of fire, settling in on them, and they became witness to the glory of God. And everybody heard, not just in Aramaic, but everybody heard from all around the world. And Yeshua said, it's going to start from there, and it's going to go from uh, Judea, Samaria, and the rest of the world. How do you think it's going to go throughout the rest of the world? Well, the rest of the world was in Jerusalem. Amen. Let's read from 17 through 21. And some thought they were drunk. They just, some people just don't believe. Some people don't have the ears and the eyes to see the significance of what they're looking at. Some people are willful unbelievers of the truth. And others... Others, the Holy Spirit opens their eyes and they're obedient to looking and, and recognizing God moving and working. And that's true today. So, 17 to 21, it says this, and it shall be in these last days, God says, and this is, this is Peter addressing the crowd because they were like, what is going on? Peter stands up. And he speaks here in verse 17. And he quotes the prophet Joel. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. That your sons and daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male uh, slaves and female slaves, I will in those days pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will put wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it will be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, will be saved. And in verse 37 and 38, let's jump down there. It says this, Now when they heard all of this, not only did he quote from Joel and other scriptures, he explained to them Messiah, and in verse 37, he says, Now when they heard this, they were all pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men, brothers, what should we do? How do we respond to this truth and we know it to be true? We are convinced of this truth. And Peter said to them, Repent. Repent. 
and each of you baptized in the name of Yeshua Messiah for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amazing. That message is still true today for us. Repent and receive. Turn from your sin. Embrace Messiah as your Savior and Lord. And receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's why we celebrate Shavuot. This is significant. And the weight of this news kind of is too big for us. The power of the Holy Spirit was fully displayed on Pentecost as 3,000 people were saved that day. And the fulfillment of Joel, chapter 2, verse 28 and 29, happened. And tongues of fire appeared on the apostles like, like a similar fire that we hear about and have read about with Moses. A rushing wind, ruach, came down. So for us believers in Yeshua as Messiah, Shavuot is made complete by the giving of the Holy Spirit. Really, it's, it's a truth for everyone. But it takes faith. It takes access through Yeshua. By giving us the Holy Spirit, Yeshua is empowering his people to be a witness to preach the good news that will bring about the salvation of all people who believe. There's parallels in the two Bikurim. From first fruits the beginning of the counting of the omer, the barley, and the first fruits of the wheat. Yeshua was giving, given at the first. The Holy Spirit was given on the second. First for our salvation, second for our sealing of promise, witness, and empowerment. There's a physical harvest of the wheat, but also a spiritual harvest harvest of the souls. 3,000 of them on that day. And it's still ongoing today. We think, about, we think about Acts, and just think about Acts for a moment. Acts is, is a story about the Holy Spirit. I know we're talking about the apostles and what they've done, but what's underlying and what's solid and consistent with every single um, apostle that that um, their story was being narrated was the Holy Spirit moving in each and every one of them and the Holy Spirit moving powerfully to be as a witness and to spread the gospel, the good news in all of the world. And Acts doesn't stop. We think that there's only 28 chapters. We're part of that witness and testimony of who God is. We participate in that. That's why Shavuot is significant. So here we are today, celebrating Shavuot, all peoples. Isn't that beautiful? Jews, Gentiles, men, women, young, old, tribes, tongues. Who, who was born from a different country? Can you raise your hand here? There you go. Who speaks a different language? Can you raise your hand? Quite a bit. We've got quite the diversity in this congregation. It's amazing. All of us have been called to be a witness to Messiah. All are called to be filled with the Holy Spirit just as the apostles were. Pentecost Shavuot is about praising God for the empowering of the Kehillah, empowering of the body of Messiah, empowering of the church. 
and the continued ministry of the Holy Spirit in us. So the importance of the Holy Spirit in our walk is incredibly important. In fact, there's no walking in this new life that Messiah, through Messiah without the Holy Spirit. It just can't happen. So let me read John chapter 14, verse 16 through 17. It says this, I will ask the Father, 14, sorry, I'll read it, here we go. I will ask the Father, Yeshua was saying, and he will give you another helper. And he, that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, but because it uh, does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you, and I will be with you. The first purpose of the Holy Spirit is to glorify Yeshua, to be, to reveal that truth. Um, And that is how we are to stand as witnesses, with the help of the Holy Spirit. That's probably the most important thing, actually, as a believer, for us to be vessels of the Holy Spirit to reveal truth, to preach the gospel, to speak the good news, because only through the gospel and through Messiah is everything overcome. Our hearts and minds And lives are changed because they're turning from their wickedness and turning towards God. That's why it's so significant and important. It is not by your convincing. It is through the Holy Spirit's power. Sometimes we think that I'm going to go save somebody. You're not going to save anybody. (laughs) It is the Holy Spirit who opens eyes and hearts and continually. And he did that for you and he will work through you and we should be in awe and, and that we get to participate in that whole thing. It is a beautiful miracle. In John chapter 14, what verse is that? I didn't put the verse. Uh, oh, <laughs> it's a repeat of um, 17. I just want to read it again. That's why I put it. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father Uh, will send in my name. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said. Let's stop here for a moment again. The Holy Spirit is divine. It's not less than. It's God. Okay? And it's not an it. It's a, he's saying a he. It applies a personal thing. And we should address the Holy Spirit in a personal way. And he knows you intimately. And knows you well. In John chapter 16, verse 13, it says this, But when he, Yeshua saying again, But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will disclose to you, what is to come. This whole relationship between the, <laughs> the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is a beautiful thing. There is no, there's no any sense of them trying to, to outdo the other. It's, it's actually so, so backwards and so far from that. They're serving one another. They just want to hear from one another. Yeshua just uh, revealed in John chapter 5, he's like, I'm not going to do anything without the Father. I only do what the Father does. And here he's saying the Holy Spirit is just the same. He's going to reveal what he hears. It's beautiful. The Holy Spirit is divine. He's God. And he's personal. I submit we have a minimum of two baptism, and some um, consider it three. 
Um, we know of one, baptism of water. And it says this in Matthew chapter 28, 19, go therefore, Yeshua was saying, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He's talking about water baptism. And, um, but there's a spirit baptism, and we see that in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, when John the Baptist recognizes this. And he says, as for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me, he's talking about Yeshua, is mightier than I. And I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And we just read that baptism occurring in the book of Acts. Yeshua himself, we see a baptism of water and a baptism of the Holy Spirit. We must undergo the same, each and every one of us. Okay, I mentioned a third. It's not in my notes, but I'll, but I'll talk about it. Um, and that's the baptism of blood. And that's the first one, actually. Baptism through salvation in Messiah, in his blood. Baptism then in water, and then baptism in the Holy Spirit. So, some questions arise when we talk about baptism in the Holy Spirit. So, I'm, at this point, I'm kind of going to get into just a little bit of some things that could be divisive. And I know that it's divisive, and I can see it even in our congregation, actually. We, everyone in every congregation, to be, to be honest with you, everyone's kind of on a spectrum when it comes to the Holy Spirit. Um, some are swinging in the chandeliers. I'm just kidding. You're not, you're not swinging in the chandeliers. You can't even reach that high. So is, we're not... Okay, just kidding. Um, some of you are just very free with the Spirit. And others, and others on the other side are, are you know, are holding back a little bit. Um, and I'm just messing with you guys who are very much Spirit-filled. <laughs> Um, so, I'm going to get into some questions that we kind of, and get into some conversations, actually, regarding the Holy Spirit, because I think it's very healthy for us. And the last thing that we want to do is look down on each other, okay? The last thing that we want to do is look down and say, you don't have the Holy Spirit. You have no idea. When, one is baptized, when is one baptized in the Holy Spirit? Is it at conversion? When are we baptized? Um, is it at a different time? There's disagreement for sure in the body. Here's my answer. <laughs> Yeshua saves us through his blood with repentance and faith and baptizes us in the Holy Spirit because that's what he does. He's the one that does it. And my answer is that we should seek both. That, that's a cop-out, isn't it? <laughs> um, for me, I happen to believe, and I, I know I'm, uh, I'm disagreeing with a lot of Pentecostal and a lot of Charismatics. It doesn't matter. I happen to believe that you receive both at conversion. And that's okay. You can disagree with me. And everything is still fine. Um, and many in the Pentecostal movement, and again, my colleagues in charismatic movement would disagree with me that it's a different experience. And we see actually in Scripture several different um, uh, examples of both. It's a mystery. 
and there's reasons why I hold to that. But don't let it affect your, your view. Just seek both. How's that? Um, the next one, when is one filled with the Spirit? Are we always filled with the Spirit? You guys ever get that? I am all the time always filled with the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> right? I hope so. <laughs> yes, Gretchen, I hope so. So you have, the truth is, you have the Holy Spirit living in you. If you believe in Messiah, you have embraced them as Lord and Savior, you have undergone that baptism of the blood, right? You have been regenerated. You have this new life. This Holy Spirit is living inside of you. And Paul urges in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, he says to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's right. That's right. He urges us to be filled with the Holy Spirit rather than not. So that's the answer for that. Again, it's, so, it's not very clear, is it? It's like, is it all the time? Sometimes it's not, and other times it is. Look at all the other examples of when the Holy Spirit filled somebody. It's when God needed somebody to act, when God needed to empower an individual to do his work. And sometimes we think we're like, I'm going to do God's work, and I'm going to do this and that. And I don't know that it's quite like that. It's more of a, I'm a servant of him, and Lord, what would you have me do? Rather than, I'm going to do this for you. And it's quite a balance. It's quite a balance. <clears throat> when we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, does this mean we display the gifts? Um, uh, the gifts reference in 1 first, first Corinthians chapter 12 and 14. So let me just offer this perspective. The Holy Spirit is God. This is God we're talking about. And sometimes we get so focused on the gifts. But the gift of the Holy Spirit is all of God. You hear me? The gift of the Holy Spirit is everything. All of Him given to you. Let's understand that. Because sometimes we're just so focused on a gift or one or two. Let's have a little bit more reverence that we have God living in this fleshly temple. That's the fact, and we should be humbled by that fact. Because sometimes these are some of the thoughts and questions that we kind of function in. This gift or that gift, do you have, are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Or am I filled with the Holy Spirit? You know, what is absolutely unbiblical, and the false idea is that you're not saved unless you're filled with the Spirit, with the demonstration of speaking in tongues. I say this because it's, I've heard it. In, I've always been in the Pentecostal and Charismatic movement. I grew up in, in multiple assembly, assemblies of God. Um, you know what? Let's just talk about it for a moment. <laughs> When I, was, um, when I was going through several interviews to become the lead pastor here, you know, um, they had a panel of interviewers, and, and we talked about the Holy Spirit greatly. We talked about many doctrines. We talked about, and they grilled me for two hours about everything foursquare. Um, but we talked about the Holy Spirit. We talked about the filling of the Holy Spirit, the gifts, and everything else. And um, and my past came out, <laughs> to say to say the least. My past came out. 
Um, I didn't know, but they sensed something. They knew something. And I wasn't being honest with myself. What was really happening was that I had wounds from growing up in the very charismatic movement. Some of these thoughts and, and some displays of the gifts that were downright abusive, actually. That, to this day, it's like I look back as a pastor, I'm like, that, that, wasn't, that wasn't from God. And what created in me was this doubt. This doubt of the Holy Spirit, this doubt of moving of the Holy Spirit, or even the gifts, actually. What created in me was because of what people had done that I had doubted God. That's what happened. I looked at people and therefore doubted God. You see what happens? Oftentimes, that what, that's what happens. We look at people and say, God, you're not it. What a blasphemous thing to say. And they said, no, you're not, you're not going to be the pastor. I'm sorry, we're not going to give you a license. And I had to search. And I had to just sit, actually. I was sitting up in that room just praying. And I knew exactly what was happening. I'm like, I doubted you. This whole time, I've, it's, it's been, there's this part of me that just has really doubted the Holy Spirit. And at times, absolutely worked through me. And I've been open to him. But there's parts of it where I'm like, no, God, I don't believe that. No, God, I don't want that. And it's not just the Holy Spirit that we treat God in that way. We treat him in Scripture in that way. Scripture is like, mm, you know, all of this is good, but this, I don't know, I don't know if I can believe that. Sometimes we lack that humility and just the, the truth of what is holding us back. So I had to repent. I really had to repent and ask God for forgiveness. I'm like, God, I, I don't want this doubt. And I acknowledge some things that were displayed before me or d done to me, actually, that were abusive and in your name, and it was wrong, and I see that now. And some of you have that experience, and I have great compassion for you. Great compassion for you. It shouldn't happen in the body, but it happens all the time. And I'm sorry, but don't doubt God. Don't doubt his Holy Spirit in you, trying to work in you. He wants to empower you and become your witness and move through you and do amazing things, not for you to boast about, but to boast about him and his glory. I look at this, I'm like, there is no way. I was about to lead this congregation without the Holy Spirit, with this doubt and unbelief in my heart. This panel had every right to say no to me. Every right. I would have done the same. You don't know what you are missing out. More can be said about the Holy Spirit. Um, today is not that day. I would love to talk about greatly the gifts and fruits. And the fruits are, to be clear, more important. You can read it in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. Galatians 5, 22 to 23 of, of the fruits. But I mentioned 13 because sometimes we skip 13, and you can't skip 13. <laughs> or if I speak the tongues of angels, but if I do not have love, or just a clanging symbol, 
or just noise. 13 gives perspective on the gifts. Love above all. Love is, is our motivation. Look, if you're a believer in Messiah, you have the Holy Spirit. And there isn't anything extra you need. Um, however, just because we have the Holy Spirit doesn't mean we're We've opened ourselves up to him, as we should. Just like my example, I've opened up parts of me, but not all of me. And this isn't just a, a, a principle of, of, of the Holy Spirit that we're talking about. This is about God and everything. Does he have everything of you? Have you submitted everything of you? When we say he is Lord of my life, do we truly believe that he is Lord of everything? Amen. Yesterday we talked about confession. And sometimes we try to hide sins. You haven't, he's not Lord of that. You're hiding something. And I forgot to say and acknowledge John Cutts was here. He came to me. Oh, hey, John. Uh, he came to me and um, he asked, hey, Joey, I have a word in tongues. And, and I know it's from the Holy Spirit. I told him, John, here you go. I trust you. There better be an interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> There better be an interpretation or we're taking this back, right? And so, um, and we're just following the prescription of order. And someone interpreted, and I know, and I'm just being very honest here, I know that maybe some here in this spectrum, like again, we are all in the spectrum here. And some here, and I have great compassion for you. Doubt rose up and says, was that really the interpretation? Because I acknowledge a little bit of that came from me as a leader. I'm like, was that the interpretation? Where I had to just, at the end of it, submit to God and say, Lord, I submit to you. I trust you in what is happening here. And Lord, this is for your glory. And I didn't hear any one bit where it was a selfish message there. And so I'm going to trust you in that one. And Lord, for your glory. And no one was seeking attention here. It was very powerful. Praise the Lord. We have all kinds of things where we're not just leaders, but everybody has to be discerning of the spirits, Right? We have to be discerning of what is, what is going on in our worship service, what is going on in our community, and as we engage, are we being led by the Holy Spirit? Do you know His voice? Do you know Him as a person? Are you open? More, more can be said, and I promise you, we will get to those. <laughs> we will talk about the Holy Spirit more. And I know some of you may disagree about certain things here and there, but there we absolutely cannot disagree that you need the Holy Spirit as you are being transformed and walking in this new life. You need him as he transforms you and as you walk with him, fruits come to bear, just the evidence of who he is. And you just don't know that these fruits are here. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. I think I missed one. Anyway. Let me end with this. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 through 38. Let's take a look at this. It says here, Yeshua was going through all the cities and villages 
teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed, dispirited, like sheep without a shepherd. They were lost, completely lost. You guys ever look at the world and think about the world in that way, in, in the areas that you're at and feel completely just brokenhearted over them, that they do not know the truth. They don't know their Messiah. They are going through this life without a shepherd. That's what Yeshua is saying here. He's looking out and saying, they need a shepherd. Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Yeshua says, I am the good shepherd. In verse 37, he says, then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. That's you and me. We are the workers of the harvest. This is great harvest of souls. And we're not doing it alone. We are not doing it on our own power. We need the Holy Spirit. We need to ask for his empowerment, for his maturity, for his, for his revealing of truth, and his for salvation of people to open their eyes. And we have to be obedient to the Holy Spirit and know him. There's more to this conversation. But today is a celebration of Shavuot. Today is a celebration of of the giving of the Holy Spirit and the completion of this appointed time, of this feast. Of God wanting us to walk in Him. And now we get to worship Him and celebrate just His goodness and His greatness. That He gets, that that Spirit is in us, living inside of us and transforming us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just, um, I just thank you, Lord. Um, I thank you for today. And I thank you, Lord, for everybody here who was made to be here today. I thank you for the work that you do, your Holy Spirit that lives inside of us and, and works and, and works about us and through us, all around us, and, and we don't understand it all. And Lord, I, I feel like that that's okay. We are talking about the infinite, and then the, here's the finite trying to understand it. And, Lord, we just want to be submitted to the Holy Spirit. We just want to be submitted to you. Lord, we just want to grow in deeper understanding of who you are and what you want us to do in this life. And many of it you've instructed us. And Lord, you have created this new spiritual life and help us. Help us, Lord. Empower us. Change us. Through the work of your Holy Spirit. I pray for anyone here who, is, who needs healing in that doubt department. I pray over them, Lord. I pray for, for the touch that only your Holy Spirit can touch them right now in Yeshua's name. I know that. And it's not all of a sudden that we, we start speaking in tongues, but I pray, Lord, that, Lord, that you would release yourself, but I pray, Lord, that we would release you. Oftentimes, we're stopping you in our own lives, Lord. I pray, Lord, for full surrender, full access to all of us, all of me, Lord. Thank you. 
Yeshua's name. Amen.